let me say a word in defense of reason in dialogue with faith. Because faith is that proof. Faith unites us to that substance. But reason, in order to realize its full potential, needs the horizons revealed by and truths contained in the faith. And not just any faith, but the Catholic faith. Now I'm going to turn to my argument that Darwinism is utterly incompatible with intelligent design. In July 2005, in the New York Times, Cardinal Christoph Schoenborn wrote, evolution in the sense of common ancestry might be true, but evolution in the neo-Darwinian sense, an unguided, unplanned process of random variation and natural selection is not. Any system of thought that denies or seeks to explain away the overwhelming evidence for design in biology is ideology, not science. I think these two sentences of the cardinals capture the crux of the discussion, and I think Cardinal Schoenborn is exactly correct here. Now let me explain why. Excuse me, it was a real good, good dinner. Um, <clears throat> discussion of evolution, Darwinism, and design becomes hopelessly confused if it, one is not exceedingly careful to define the terms and use them consistently. The definition of evolution that I will use is simply descent with modification, nothing more. That is, I use the word evolution to mean that organisms are related to each other by a process of physical descent, but the mechanism driving the origin and major changes in life is left unspecified. Now, by itself, such a restricted notion of evolution, while interesting, has very little limited importance to philosophy and theology. As Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger wrote in 1986 in his short book, In the Beginning, A Catholic Understanding of the Story of Creation and the Fall, it is the affair of the natural sciences to explain how the tree of life in particular continues to grow and how new branches shoot out from it. This is not a matter for faith. Most difficulties on the topic arise only when we begin to discuss the mechanism of evolution. That is, what exactly caused the major changes of life? What caused life to evolve into intricate and complex forms? On this point, the future Pope Benedict XVI was clear. He wrote, let us go directly to the question of evolution and its mechanisms. Microbiology and biochemistry have brought revolutionary insights here. They have brought us to the awareness that an organism and a machine have many points in common. Their functioning presupposes a precisely thought through and therefore reasonable design. And he continued, we must have the audacity to say that the great projects of the living creation are not the products of chance and error. They point to a creating reason and show us a creating intelligence, and they do so more luminously and radiantly today than ever before. Let us pause to notice three of Cardinal, then Cardinal Ratzinger's points. First, he says that life is not due to chance and error, a clear repudiation of the Darwinian claim. Second, <coughs> second, there is physical evidence, physical evidence of design and purpose, the great projects of a living creation, which point to a creating reason. And third, Ratzinger cites the science of biochemistry, which studies the molecular foundation of life as having particular relevance. 
It is biochemistry that has brought revolutionary insights. That is, biochemistry has uncovered new physical evidence pointing to design. And it is molecular biochemical systems that clearly presuppose a precisely thought through and therefore reasonable design. With this in mind, let's consider candidates for the mechanism of evolution. Specifically for the evolution of the, quote, great projects of the living creation, close quote. The ones which, quote, point to a creating reason, close quote. The ones, <clears throat> let's consider Darwinism. What is Darwinism? Well, recall that Cardinal Schoenborn defines Darwinism as an unguided, unplanned process of random variation and natural selection. In other words, the very definition of Darwinism precludes a creating reason. If the great projects of the living creation were unplanned, if the process leading to them was unguided, then they cannot point to a creating reason, reason because in actual fact, nothing specifically intended them. In other words, Darwinian evolution of the great projects of life explicitly rules out planning or guidance by anyone, pointedly including God. No Christian who thinks consistently can accept that. Handsome fellow. Uh, <laughs> Cardinal Schoenborn's definition of Darwinism has been challenged by some Christian thinkers such as University of Delaware physics professor Stephen Barr, uh, who we are privileged to have with us, uh, when he was writing in the magazine First Things in the year 2005. The gist of Steve's most important objection is the following. Although some materialistic, ideology-driven scientists do indeed use words like unguided and unplanned, the hapless scientists are either careless or overstepping the bounds of science. The only scientifically defensible statement that can be made is that the process driving Darwinian evolution is random. Here, Barr means that the word random is used only in a scientifically technical sense, simply to mean uncorrelated. So the true scientific sense of random is just that mutations are not matched to the needs of the organism. Mutations arise independently of the needs of the organism. Grand claims about guidance need not be considered. In other words, the great projects of the living creation may indeed have been planned, but we can't tell scientifically. So Professor Barr accuses Cardinal Schoenborn of illegitimately introducing the theologically charged words unguided and unplanned in his definition of Darwinism. But purely scientific Darwinian theory uses the neutral word random. I think that Steve's criticism of Cardinal Schoenborn is profoundly mistaken in two ways. First, the scientific community, as represented by its leading members and by its leading teaching organization, contradicts Professor Barr. They explicitly do mean that Darwinian evolution was unguided and unplanned. Second, the substitution of the word random, even in a technical sense of uncorrelated, simply does not change the bottom line. Even if evolution were just random in Barr's technical scientific sense, it cannot be said that the great projects of the living creation point to a creating reason. Let me amplify these points. <clears throat> I should have stood in front of the mirror and timed this. <clears throat> First, 
the scientific community does indeed mean that evolution was unguided and unplanned by anyone, including God. For example, in 1995, the National Association of Biology Teachers, the leading organization of teachers of biology in this country, issued the following statement, quote, the diversity of life on Earth is the outcome of evolution, colon, an unsupervised, impersonal, unpredictable, and natural process of temporal descent with genetic modification. It is not at all difficult to figure out who they were intending to exclude with the words unsupervised and impersonal. Under public relations pressure, the NABT later revised its definition of evolution to leave out those words with the understanding that the word natural implied them anyway. But the first statement clearly takes the temperature of the organization. By Darwinian evolution, the members of our largest science teachers association explicitly mean a process unguided and unplanned by anyone. Here's a second example. In September 2005, two months after Cardinal Schoenborn's essay appeared in the New York Times, a group of 39 Nobel laureates sent an open letter to the Kansas State Board of Education which was then embroiled in an evolution teaching controversy. The letter defined Darwinian evolution explicitly. Evolution is understood to be the result of an unguided, unplanned process of random variation and natural selection. Let me emphasize, this letter used the exact same terminology to define Darwinian evolution as Cardinal Schoenborn used in his earlier essay. The letter defining Darwinian evolution as unguided and unplanned was signed by Richard Axel, Nobel Laureate in Medicine 2004, Linda Bach, Medicine 2004, Gunter Blobel, Medicine 1999, Aaron Chechenover, Chemistry 2004, Dudley Hirschbach, Chemistry 1986, Avram Hirschko, Chemistry 2004, Roald Hoffman, Chemistry 1981, Robert Horvitz, Medicine 2002, and many others. Now, if the leading scientists who investigate biology and evolution, represented by Nobel Prize winners in science, explicitly say that by Darwinian evolution, they do mean a process that is unguided and unplanned, then that's what Darwinian evolution means. We are not free to use terms in our own way, to invent our own private definitions, ignoring how the terms are used by most people in the field. That only confuses the issue. Darwinian evolution means unguided and unplanned. I think it is clear, therefore, that no consistent Christian can accept Darwinian evolution. But is it possible that we could have a philosophically tame Darwinism? Perhaps call it by another name to avoid confusion with what scientists actually mean by the term. Tamed Darwinism could mean something like what Professor Barr had in mind that mutations are technically random, uncorrelated with the needs of an organism, but that definition would carry no philosophical implications about being unplanned or unguided, as the Nobel laureates intended. We would leave those philosophical questions out of science. My response is a strong no. It is not possible. There is no such thing as tame Darwinism. Either the great projects of the living creation required planning or they did not. Random, in Barr's technical scientific sense, is no different from unplanned or unguided in the Nobel laureate sense. Let me explain. 
First, let us assume there is at least some true contingency in nature, including biology. For example, suppose some mutations do occur randomly in the sense that not even God explicitly intended them to happen. They are simply the byproducts of various physical processes, perhaps foreseen by God, but unintended for themselves even by God. Such mutations, of course, would occur in a manner uncorrelated with the needs of an organism. Now, scientists see mutations that appear to fit that description all the time. Neutral changes, genetic accidents, they all happen in a way in which, if we allow that there is at least some contingency in biology, appear unintended. The claim of scientists such as Nobel laureates that evolution is an unguided, unplanned process is simply the claim that such small, contingent, unintended mutations, which we have assumed do exist, are sufficient when coupled to the Darwinian mechanism of natural selection to account for the great projects of the living creation, birds, fish, bacteria, the eye, molecular machines, everything. Nothing further is necessary, no planning or guidance. So Professor Barr's use of random in the sense of uncorrelated is a distinction without a difference. If the mutations that build the great projects of life are simply technically random or uncorrelated, then they are indeed unplanned and unguided too. And if random mutations can be put together to form the great projects of life, then those features of life needed no design. One objection that is often raised is that perhaps God designed the laws of the universe in the knowledge that they would lead to some sort of life. So in that sense, at least, we can say that the God is the designer of life. But such a view falls radically short. Consider the kaleidoscope. The kaleidoscope is a toy containing small, brightly colored, tumbling objects and a set of mirrors which reflect the view of the tumbling objects into repeating symmetric patterns. The inventor of the kaleidoscope can be credited with planning a machine which makes pretty patterns, but he can't be considered responsible for individual patterns that a kaleidoscope forms. So if, while playing around with a kaleidoscope, we observe a particular pattern which strikes us as really very attractive, we do not credit the inventor with that particular pattern. In truth, that particular kaleidoscope pattern was unguided and unplanned. In the same way, if the great projects of the living creation arise from simply the laws of nature, then, like a kaleidoscope pattern, we cannot say that they were guided or planned. But the view that God designed just the laws of the universe and the knowledge that they would lead to some sort of life or other with some sort of features has even worse problems. The great projects of the living creation, such as those discovered by biochemistry, about which Cardinal Ratzinger exclaimed, actually point more strongly to purposeful design than do the bare laws of nature. No matter how you slice it, in light of modern science, the eye or the bacterial flagellum, intracellular transport or a wing uh, the uh, exhibit a greater finality, a clearer purpose than do, say, the law of gravity or electromagnetism or natural selection, all of which are quite general. The purpose of the eye or the flagellum, however, are very specific. Both are quite precisely fitted to their jobs. Yet, if we are unable to discern design in systems which exhibit greater finality, 
then we cannot discern design in systems that exhibit less. If for any reason we cannot conclude that the eye was intended, then we cannot conclude that photons were intended either, or that the laws of electromagnetism were intended. The bottom line is that if the great projects of the living creation do not point to a creating reason, then nothing in nature does. If we cannot tell that they were planned, then we cannot tell that anything in nature was planned. Now, I know that over time, the term intelligent design has acquired a lot of baggage. So please put aside any preconceived notions you may have, and let me try to reintroduce the term afresh. What is intelligent design? Despite what newspapers may lead one to believe, it has nothing to do with creationism, intervention in nature, or other such negative connotations. Rather, it is simply the assertion that design is empirically detectable, that design can be deduced from physical evidence, that the actions of intelligent agents can leave marks in nature and we can discern the actions of intelligent agents from those marks. Can we really tell from the physical empirical evidence that the great projects of the living creation were designed? Yes, we can. The future Pope Benedict XVI was exactly right when he wrote, we must have the audacity to say that the great projects of the living creation are not the products of chance and error. They point to a creating reason and show us a creating intelligence, and they do so more luminously and radiantly today than ever before. In other words, if we agree with Benedict XVI, we must have the confidence to say that the physical evidence shows such things as the eye, wing, or molecular machinery were planned. The processes which produced them were guided. Physical evidence shows that they were specifically intended. We must insist that without specific planning and guidance, they would not have come about, even given the general laws of nature. In other words, they were purposely designed.